Hi, I'm Ellen from EVPL Oakland Library. Welcome to Chapter Book Storytime. On this week's edition of the Variety Pack, I've got another mystery to share with you. A good summer story. It's called Wreck at Ada's Reef, part of a new series called The Swallowtail Legacy by Michael D. Bile. A good summer story. An action-packed and very suspenseful mystery. As the story opens, Lark and her sister Piper arrive on Swallowtail Island, where they're going to spend the whole summer vacation. It's located in the western part of Lake Erie, and Lark and Piper have spent, used to spend many summers in their childhood there, but this year it's going to be very different. Chapter 1 It's a drizzly Sunday morning, the day after my 12th birthday, and my family such as it is, has arrived at Swallowtail Island in the western end of Lake Erie. All six of us stand on the foredeck of the ferry, Niagara, as it makes the turn at the buoy marked R3 at the entrance to the harbor. My ten-year-old sister Piper and I shiver in our thin cotton dresses, our arms pocked with goosebumps as the town comes into view before us. Its two piers are like long arms reaching out into the harbor to greet us. That's Piper's interpretation or to push us away. That's mine. As the Niagara bullies its way down the narrow channel, its bow pushing a wall of water, the previously unruffled surface is pulled and stretched like gray taffy. Moored boats dance in our wake as we pass, bounds and sterns rising and dipping with each wave. Near the east shore, a fleet of mallards steams toward a dilapidated wooden dock, and above me a single gull cries, then swoops down to see if I have anything to offer it. Pogo, our English setter, sets beside me, body quivering and tail held high in the air. I reach down and stroke the top of her head, but she doesn't take her eyes off the gull for a second. My heart leaps when we bump against the pilings at the ferry dock and lines are made fast. We have arrived. Without a word, Piper slips her tiny hand into mine. Together, our hearts pound out a rhythm that I am sure can be heard over the whining engine and shouts of the dock hands. Our stepfather, Thomas, gathers Piper and me along with his own three boys, Blake, Nate, and Jack, with his long arms. Everybody ready? We should get a family picture. This is a big... Let's not, I say. When I was five and Piper three, our dad died when the small plane, piloted by his best friend, crashed into the Connecticut River a few hundred yards short of the runway at Goodspeed Airport. That same summer, Thomas's wife was killed by a falling tree branch while she was jogging in Central Park. Four and a half years later, Mom married Thomas. They had been friends, nothing more, they both insisted, in college and reconnected at a class reunion. So we had kind of a Brady Bunch thing going for a couple of years, but then, three months ago, Mom died. And what was left? Thomas and his kids and then Piper and me. I don't know what we are exactly, but it doesn't feel quite like a family. Come on, Lark, Piper says, squeezing my hand. We should. I'm saved from the indignity of a family selfie there on the foredeck by one of the ferry's crews. Okay, folks, need to ask you to move along. We wind our way down the steep metal staircase and onto the gangplank. When I reach the end, I hesitate before taking the final step onto the worn wood planks of the pier, but there is, I know, no turning back. For the next 72 days, yes, I'm counting, this is home. I'm not off the hook for that family portrait yet, though. Thomas has already recruited a woman in a yellow slicker to take our picture in front of the sign that announces, Welcome to Swallowtail Island, and is busy composing the shot. Lark, since you're the tallest, in the back with me and Blake. I grunt and move into my assigned place. Sometimes it's easier just to do what Thomas wants and get it over with. The woman in yellow says, smile. And I do my best to provide something that at least resembles one. My teeth are clearly visible, so that counts, right? With that little bit of torture out of the way, the other five of us leave Blake, not quite 14, in charge of our bags and the cage holding my budgie, Bedlam, and trudge toward town to get our bearings and to find a ride to the house that has been in our family since the 1920s and where Mom spent her summers as a kid. The last time I was here was the summer I turned 10, 
the same summer that mom first got sick. After that, it was like someone hit pause on our lives. For the next two years, the only traveling we did was on I-95 between Connecticut and Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. It was a lawyer who pressed play, calling us into his office the week after mom died to tell Piper and me that the house on Swallowtail Island now belonged to the two of us. Lark's stepdad, Thomas, has suggested that Lark keep a journal over the summer, uh, which will help her process a lot of her emotions and strong feelings that she's going to be having, returning to a place that is so full of memories and so was so special to her mother. Uh, as she begins her journal, she makes a promise to you, the reader. For the moment, there's only one rule when it comes to my story. I promise to be honest. Otherwise, what's the point? But I should probably clarify, just because I promise not to lie doesn't mean I'm going to tell you the entire truth. I'm not one of those people who is determined to share every unspoken thought with the world, and I don't want to be. Here's the God's honest truth about me. There are places in my own brain that when I make a wrong turn and accidentally up, end up there, I turn around and get out as fast as I can. No need to go poking around places like that. Who knows what I'll find? Even before Lark gets to the roost, which is the name of their summer home, Lark learns about the local mystery. We stop in front of the old-fashioned drugstore where we arrange for a wagon to take all of us and our stuff to the house. Oh, I forgot to mention, on this island, cars aren't allowed. You're allowed horse-drawn vehicles, bicycles, and golf carts, and that's it. So they're waiting for a wagon to take them to the home. The boys go inside with their dad while Piper and I stay out on the sidewalk. She wanders a few doors down to pet a horse that is harnessed to a small Amish-style buggy while I peek through the front window at a stack of the local newspaper, The Swallowtail Citizen. The headline reads, Tragedy Strikes Swallowtail 75 Years Ago. And next to it is a grainy black and white photo that takes up the top right quarter of the page. It shows the wrecked hull of an old school wooden speedboat like something from an old movie. There are several ragged holes across the bottom of the boat, the largest a good three feet long. Not all of the article is visible through the glass, but I'm able to read enough to learn that the writer is convinced that the speedboat crash that killed Albert Pritchard was no accident, and that it was probably also connected to the death of the town's most important citizen, Captain Edward Cheever. Pritchard was Cheever's lawyer and was returning from visiting friends in Ontario, Canada when he plowed into the rocks known as Ada's Reef, just west of Swallowtail Island. When I read as far as I can through the drugstore window, I go back to the top where I see that the article was written by Nadine Pritchard, mom's oldest friend and the main character in just about every story from her childhood. The family finally arrives at the roost and spends the rest of the day settling in. And just as Thomas predicted, the flood of emotions and memories that come back can be both upsetting and comforting at the same time. The next day, Thomas and the kids discuss their summer activities. Thomas points to an item in the Island Activities for Kids column in the Swallowtail Citizen. I read it silently and set the paper on the table. Starts a week from today, he says. What is it? Piper asks. Soccer camp, Thomas says. When he says the word soccer, everyone stops chewing and looks straight at me, mouths wide open. Blake is the first to regain his gift of speech. Soccer camp? I thought she wasn't allowed to after... After what, Blake, I say? The incident? That's how it's known in the family. The incident on the soccer field. I've started calling it the ISF just to save time. For now, here's all you need to know. Number one, I was involved in an incident during soccer practice after school. Number two, I got kicked off the tree team for the rest of the season. If I follow all the rules laid down by the principal and athletic director, they might let me back next year. Then again, they might not. Number three, the school agreed not to put it on my permanent record as long as I promised to get counseling. Since adults freak out whenever the words permanent record are said, Thomas immediately accepted the deal. So now I have to go to these deep, meaningful chats with a therapist every couple of weeks. Ugh. One more thing. 
I am, well, I was the best player on the team. Not bragging, just being honest. A couple of boarding schools in Connecticut have, have asked me to visit their campuses, and the word scholarship has been mentioned, which is another reason that Thomas was so worried about the ISF showing up on my permanent record. No one here knows about that, or needs to, says Thomas. What's past is past. It's like Marcus Aurelius said, our lives lie within the present. The past is done and the future is uncertain. Anyway, Lark is moving on and so am I. I think the camp would be good for all of you. Make some friends, get some exercise. The coaches are all college players, including one girl, sorry, one young woman from UNC. You could talk to her about what it's like playing there, Lark. It's mornings, eight to noon. You'll have the rest of the day to do whatever you want. Later that day, their mom's childhood friend, Nadine, stops by, and Lark gets a chance to ask about the mystery in the newspaper. The crash is interesting, to be sure, and it will sell some papers, which will make the editor happy, but it's really just one little piece in a thousand-piece puzzle. There's a woman on the island, Dinah Purdy. She's 93. The book's really about her. She's absolutely amazing, and hardly anybody knows what she's accomplished in her life which, believe me, is a lot. And if I know you, that's going to change very soon, Thomas says. Nadine points north along the shore. Dinah lives alone in a little cottage out on Rabbit Ear Point, a couple of miles past the museum. Her father was Captain Cheever's first mate, and he built the place back in the 20s. Dinah left the island for college and law school in the 40s. This is an African-American woman who we're talking about, the first member of her family to go to college. She came back every summer and spent two or three weeks on the island, and when she finally retired seven or eight years ago, she was determined to stay in the cottage, even though it's pretty isolated, especially in the winter. I wrote a little story about it that at the time. She said she wanted to spend the rest of her days reading good books, watching the birds, and listening to the waves. So, how is she connected to the speedboat, I asked. But before Nadine can answer, I add another question. And the man who was killed... He was your grandfather? That's right, says Nadine. I'm still trying to figure out all the connections. Like I said, this puzzle is complicated. I'm spending my days and nights reading old legal documents and talking to everyone who was alive back then. The list of people who remember those days is getting shorter and shorter. Would you like some help? An assistant, maybe? Thomas asks, looking right at me. Sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but this sounds like it's right up Lark's alley. I think she'd be perfect. She's incredibly observant and has a mind like a bear trap. Once it gets in there, she never lets it go. Way smarter than me. Kate and I used to read mysteries aloud to her, and she'd always figure them out before we got to the end. And she was the only one. We would guess, but we'd be wrong every time. Nadine put her hand on my arm. I would love it, and I do need the help, but I insist on paying you. How about 150 a week? And I promise no more than 15 hours. You can come over in the afternoons. A hundred and fifty dollars a week, I say. You're serious? Cross my heart, Nadine says. It looks like Lark Summer is pretty well scheduled. Soccer camp in the morning and at Nadine's in the afternoon to do a little bit of work. When she arrives at Nadine's for her first day of work, Lark discovers that solving the mystery of Mr. Pritchard's death will have a big impact on the future of Swallowtail Island. Now, let's go back to 1889. That's when Captain Edward Cheever is born, right here on the island. His only sibling, Gilbert, doesn't come along until 1902, so they're, what, uh, 13 years apart? And they're never close, which is going to matter later. Eventually, Edward gets married and has a daughter, Ada, who's born the same year as Dinah Purdy. He's happy for a few years, and then it all starts to fall apart. A flu epidemic hits the island the winter Ada turns 12, and both she and her mother die, leaving the captain all alone. He lives a few more years and then drops dead of a, well, they say it was a broken heart, but most likely it was a heart attack or maybe a stroke. Are you with me so far? Got it, I say. In my brain, I've already start, started constructing a timeline. Turning her attention back to the map, she points at the northwest corner of the island, tracing a dotted line across a big chunk of it. 
Okay, so when Captain, Captain Cheever dies, he owns all this land, everything north of this line, something in the neighborhood of 500 acres or almost 20% of the island, a lot of land. Unfortunately, the only will that the captain leaves behind is one written in the 30s that naturally leaves everything to his wife and daughter. One little problem, they're already dead. So who gets it? His only living heir, that brother he hates, Gilbert. Oh man, that's terrible, I say. Yeah, it is, says Nadine, and the captain's relatives still own most of it. They gave or sold a few acres to the town, but all the rest is still in their grubby little hands. But hold on, we're not done yet. There's one not so little surprise in the will. This part is a little complicated. The captain has made a provision for his old friend and first mate, Elias Purdy, Dinah's father. He wanted to take care of Elias, who had lost his wife right after Dinah was born. So he did what a lot of people did back then. He left Elias a life estate on the land north of this line and east of this one, including all of Rabbit Ear Point, where the Purdies live in a small cottage. A life estate is a legal thing. It means that as long as Elias was alive, he could stay on the land. Technically, he didn't own it, but he had the right to live on it rent-free and couldn't be kicked off. At the time of the captain's death, Elias was in his 50s, and Dinah was about 17 and ready to leave for college. And the fact is, land on the island wasn't worth very much back then. But here's one more wrinkle, and it's a doozy. The life estate didn't end when Elias died. The will was written in such a way that the life estate passed on to Dinah and continued until her death, or when 75 years had passed. When the captain died, it would... It probably never crossed anyone's mind that Dinah would still be alive, but here we all are. And on July 28th, the 75th anniversary of the captain's death and the execution of the will, full ownership of the land, land that's now worth millions, by the way, will go back to the Cheevers. Are you serious? They're going to kick a 93-year-old lady out of her house? They have said that they hope it doesn't come to that. What they mean is that they hope she's dead by the time they get around to bulldozing that part of the island. Bulldozing? What are they going to do? Exactly what you'd expect of people with buckets of money and zero imagination. Ugly condos, hideous McMansions, a golf course. The real shame is that they are going to ruin hundreds of acres of wildlife habitat, land that's basically untouched by humans. There are foxes, mink, beavers, muskrats, not to mention tens of thousands of birds that nest along the shore and on Cattail Island. Even if they don't destroy it, they're going to disrupt it for years. Swallowtail is going to be a very different place very soon. The Cheevers are very keen on allowing cars on the island, which would push up the value of the land even more. Their dream is to turn, turn it into a Midwestern Nantucket, a place that only really wealthy people can afford. Isn't there anything you can do? I'm working on it, but time and just about everyone and everything are against me. The locals think it's, think it's going to mean lots of jobs for them, and it will for a while. But then what? It's not like they're going to be able to afford to buy those places. It's all for summer people. I'm not saying that the Cheevers shouldn't be able to build anything, only that there should be some limits in place to protect the island. So far, though, I'm spitting in the wind. There has to be something we can do, I say. Can we back up for a second? Didn't you say that the boat crash had something to do with all this? I'm sure it did. I just can't prove it. Albert Pritchard, my grandfather, was the captain's lawyer and a close friend. The crash happened the day after the captain died. Pretty suspicious, wouldn't you say? The two of them dying one day apart. The accounts of the accident just don't add up. Albert grew up boating and had been around the island hundreds of times. Why suddenly did he cut that particular corner? That does seem weird, I say. There's more. Gilbert Cheever, the captain's brother, was a lawyer too. He worked for my grandfather, who was several years younger than he was. After the crash, though, he conveniently took over all of Albert's clients. Something about it all, the timing, the connections, Albert cutting that corner at Ada's Reef, it just doesn't add up. With that introduction to the mystery, Lark is ready to get to work. And her first assignment, to read the inquest report from the coroner's investigation. Nadine explains what that is. 
Basically, whenever anyone dies suddenly or unexpectedly, the coroner investigates and determines the cause of death. It's kind of like the trial. There's usually witnesses, but it's not to decide if somebody is guilty or innocent, only how the person died. I've really only skimmed through it so far. You want to give it a try? It's a little hard to read in places. Some of the copies aren't great, but see what you think. I leave through the pages and flip back to the cover sheet. How should I, I, I mean, should I take notes or highlight stuff or, or what? And uh, how do I know what's important? That's the real challenge, she says. Anything that catches your eye or seems fishy. The problem is we don't know what we're looking for. Have to hope we know it when we see it. Highlight whatever you think is important. Jot your comments or questions in the margin. Here's a notebook if you want to write more. Highlighters and pens are, well, everywhere. Why don't you go sit out on the patio in the back? No sense being cooped up in here on a nice day. Help yourself to drinks and snacks in the kitchen. One of the perks of working for me is that there's always a jar full of homemade ginger snaps. The only cookie worth eating, my Aunt Carol's recipe. Nadine has a hunch or a suspicion that Albert's death was no accident. And she has no idea what direction she should take this investigation to find out more and to get to the truth. But as Lark begins to read the coroner's investigation, the coroner's inquest report, uh, she discovers that there were three witnesses to the boat accident. They saw it, and they're still alive today. One is Gilbert Cheever, another is Dinah Purdy, and the third is a man by the name of Simon Stanford. And as they begin to investigate, now they have a way to investigate, some people to ask what happened. And they find out that there were two boats by Ada's Reef that evening. Now, although it would be nice for Nadine to find out about her family, to get some closure in this family mystery, what happened to Albert, it's also an, uh, an accident, a murder, that's going to have impact on Swallowtail Island. And as they get closer and closer to the truth, there are people who would rather that this murder or that the truth stays buried at the bottom of the lake. So this is the mystery, The Swallowtail Legacy Wreck at Ada's Reef by Michael D. Bile. It's available in print at EBPL. Thank you so much for joining me today for Chapter Book Storytime Variety Pack. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.